Good morning, celebration. How y'all doing? We're happy to see you this morning. How about we put our hearts and minds together to worship the Lord? Come on. Thank you, Jesus. The Spirit was full. Come rest on us, come rest on us. The Spirit was full of the world, Spirit come move on the rock. Come rest on us, come rest on us. Come now, Spirit, when you move, make my heart feel the room.
was shed for us. We thank you, God. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. A sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt. Chains freed my soul for the first time I had hope. So thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved.
give Jesus a standing ovation. Come on, give it to him. We love you. This room is different. I'm new here. I've never been here before, but I have to acknowledge this room is different. The only thing that makes it different is that you can sense that the presence of God is in this room. That's the only thing that makes it different. I mean, you're in rooms with this many people all the time. If you go to Kroger, you go to Target, you go to Walmart, you're in rooms with this many people all the time. The only thing that makes this room different is that the presence of God is here. And, and I'll, I'll tell you how you can measure how much the presence of God is affecting you personally. Do you feel more peace than you did before you walked through the door? Do you, do you feel a little bit more, a little taller, a little stronger, a little bit more confident, a little bit more brave, more faith, because it's a hard world out there, isn't it? It's hard. It's hard. It's tough. But when we come into the sanctuary, the psalmist says in Psalms 26, verse 8, I love the sanctuary because it's where his presence dwells. Let's give him one more standing ovation. We love you. We love you. We love you. Let's say thank you to the worship team. Thank you so much. Thank you, 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 thank you. Now turn around and look at somebody and say, I'm glad you're here. Go ahead. All right. If you're visiting with us, if somebody invited you to church this week um, and you're visiting with us, even if someone didn't invite you, you just were, you just saw the sign, you wanted to come. I want you to know, uh, you're our honored guest, and uh, since it's your first time here and you took a chance on us, you didn't know if you were going to like us or not, you had other things that you could have done this morning, I mean, this is your weekend, you get to do whatever you want to do, you decided to come to church. As a way of saying thank you, we want to buy you lunch today. And so when you walk out those doors, there's a table on the left. There's a Visa card for $15. If you're married, you both get one. If you're single, go out and get your wife, come back, then you can have two. Um, but you get one, and it's, it's lunch on us just to say thank you for coming. And if you like what you feel in the room, give us one year of your life. I promise you, you will never again be the same. Everyone should have received one of these um, envelopes. If you didn't, raise your hand and our, our visitor, our, I'm sorry, our, our, our ushers will bring you one. Everybody, everybody, even if it's your first time here, everyone needs one of these. And, and this is why. Uh, I want you to pull out the stickers. Um, we did this last week, but I have every intention on doing this every week. And this is why. I genuinely believe that every single one of us can hear the voice of God. I genuinely believe that. And when we want to hear him, all we got to do is just give him a second and thoughts will start coming to our mind. And you will think, I don't know if that's God talking to me. I don't know if that's me talking to me. But I'll promise you this. The more you respond, the more you'll hear it and the more sure you will become that what you're hearing from God is God. A lot of times people are like, I don't know if that's God, so I'm not going to do anything. The more you lean into it, the more you'll recognize it. And so what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to take out these Hello, My Name Is stickers. And I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. And if the Lord brings somebody to your mind that you believe he wants you to invite to church next Sunday, not two Sundays from now, not three Sundays from now, next Sunday, like seven days from today. I want you to write their name on the sticker. And I want you to go out and I want you to hang it on that clothesline. Now, why? 
I get a list of all those names every Monday. And last week it was Thursday, but I want it on Monday. And, and I read every single name in my prayer time. And some of those names, I'll come across it and I'll end up, I'll feel the Lord tell me, just keep on praying about that name. Now, I don't know what that name is, but I just feel like I should be praying about that name. I pray for every single name that when you invite them, they'll want to say yes. Now, you might be in this room. You are the person that was asked. And I just want to say, I've been praying for you all week and you don't even know it. Um, I, I, I've been praying for you. Because I genuinely believe that every single one of us, we are in desperate need of a miracle. That all of us in this room are in desperate need of a miracle. Now it's different. Some people it's emotional. Some people it's financial. Some people it's physical. But we're all in desperate need of a miracle. Only Jesus can fix it. And I believe that when we're in our, his presence and we're worshiping him, miracles still happen. And so there are people in our life that we love too much to not invite them to church. Sometimes we'll go all the way to Guatemala or Bogota on a mission trip to help people and tell people about Jesus that we don't even know. And we skip right over our friends and right over our family. And, and we cannot do that. And so if you're a guest here and, and you like the service, I believe the Lord will speak to you as well. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds, and I'm just going to shut up for 30 seconds and uh, just give you an opportunity to just like quiet and just say, God, is there anybody you want me to bring? And then just write it down on that sticker. Now, if you are a guest here and someone put your name on that sticker, don't take it down. There's green stickers that we're going to put on it. And then we all get to get encouraged. We're like, oh, my goodness, look at all those green stickers. All these people came to church. Let me pray for you and your family. Father, in the name of Jesus, every person here needs your presence and loves you. I pray in the name of Jesus that not one person here will feel condemnation from the devil that tells them that they haven't been in church in a long time. How dare them try to come to church or they're a sinner. Those are all thoughts from Satan. Lord, bless them. Pull them into your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're visiting with us, don't touch your purse or your wallet. The next few minutes is just for our church family. We're going to offer the Lord our tithes and our offerings. And this is the scripture I want to encourage you with. It's in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 11. It says, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They believe, or they imagine rather, that it is a wall too high to climb. The wealth of the rich, they believe that the more money they have, the safer they are. They imagine it too high to climb. The key word in there is imagine. And the truth of the matter is, is that sickness, doesn't matter how much money you have, you can still get sick. Doesn't matter how much money you have, you can still get depressed. And depression's a scary thing. I've been transparent about how I fight depression. Every time I admit that, somebody comes and hands me a scripture in the, in the foyer. Look, I'm anointed to preach it, but I got to fight it like everybody else. Amen. Amen. Depression can get into regardless of how much money you have. But here's the thing. There is a God that still moves and still protects and still causes miracles to happen. And I honor you for trusting them today. Let me pray for you one last time. Lord, bless them for their faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. One of my best friends in the whole world is here. Come on up here, Pat Schatzlein. Make them feel welcome. I love them. Give them your undivided attention.
Listen, first service was way more excited than y'all. I'm not trying to start anything, but my spirit is so stirred. Because I believe God is looking for dwelling places. Depots. Places where people can stop and drink. And you're in that house. I don't believe I felt what I felt this morning in a long time. In just a moment, I'm going to have you show Father some praise. But just before I do that, I just want to speak to your leadership. I love these two. They're two of the most authentic, real people in the world. And Karen and I have been friends with them. My beautiful wife, Karen, by the way, she sends you greetings. She's my gift from God. We've been married. There she is right there. And if I look back, I'll start lusting. And so you can't do that and preach. So I got to get to the house. You take over. <laughs> and so anyway, um, we've been married 31 years. Daughter leaves for college tomorrow morning. And uh, she's our gift from the Lord. Nine months. My son's a pastor in Fort Worth, and he's about to lead a uh, movement against human trafficking. He and my daughter in love, Adrian, our two grandson grandsons, Jack and Andy, you'll see them playing for Alabama someday, prophesying their future. <laughs> but Karen and I love these two because they're the real deal. And I mean that. We've watched you plow, we've watched you fight, we've watched you love, we've watched you encourage. And we've watched how you live in the secret place. And I just want to say, thanks for trusting me today. I will honor this pulpit. But you and I, y'all, we're family for life. Don't you love your leadership? Don't you love them? They're just, they're just the real deal. But the Lord spoke to me several years ago. I was speaking at some event, and they read my resume, uh, the books we've written and all that stuff, and traveled and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, man, I was just sitting on the front row just, you know, just drinking that poison. And I walk up on stage. They're introduced me. They're reading all this stuff. And, and God said, are you happy? From this point on, every time you stand up, you have the people give me 10 seconds of praise. And you're going to have them give me praise because it is never about the donkey he rides in on. Now, obviously, I love the way Pastor just introduced me. It was just simple. This is my friend. Highest compliment in the world. But would you get up on your feet and give God 10 seconds of praise? Come on. Can we do that? Come on. It's all right. Ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Come on, church. 2. One, give him a shout. There you are, second service. And you may be seated across this house. As I get ready to go into this word, I, I want to warn you that contents of this message is harmful to your flesh. You see, I don't travel anymore for because I have to after three million miles of traveling around the world and five continents and, and all of that. I don't travel because I have to anymore. I travel for a covenant. I travel for relationship. And I have been watching Celebration for many, many years. And I'm going, what they're doing is special. I watched in the hurricane as you rescued people. I watched as you've reached out and loved people. I've watched as it's authentic, it's real. You're in the safest place you could be in in Texas. And by the way, we moved to Texas four years ago. So I'm a part of Texas now, and I ain't never leaving. Amen. <laughs> I mean, y'all, y'all done adopted a redneck. But what I want you to know is I get ready to go into this word over the next few minutes. I want to tell you that you're going to feel the Holy Spirit overwhelm you even deeper. And, and maybe he's going to walk by. And, you know, I live by the whisper. Matthew 10, 27 says, what I whisper to you in the dark, you'll proclaim from the rooftops. My whole life, our ministry, our business, everything we do is about the whisper. When we write books, uh, the, the first book is called, that I wrote was called, Why is God so mad at me? He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. And then the, the second book was, I am remnant. I'm going to be sharing with a class later today about that, that we're called to be the remnant. How many of you know we're living in the day and age where truth is a new hate speech? But the enemy of truth is silence, and you better rise up with the power of the Holy Spirit. You should be a mobile upper room. When you walk into places, demons ought to dive out windows. 
Something in you should change atmosphere. You should never have to say a word. I sit down on planes every week, and, or, or a lot, and I'll sit down on a plane next to a guy, and I'm just like looking at my phone or whatever, and all of a sudden he'll go, hey, what's different about you? And I'll go, oh, here we go. I was just watching ESPN, come on. But then an encounter happens. But then, then we wrote a, I wrote a book called Unqualified, and I'm mentioning that for a reason, because I believe that God is about to use the nobodies. The day of celebrity Christianity is over. And I, I wrote a chapter in that book because the whole, I've, for many, many years, I've always felt so unqualified. God, I'm so unqualified. And so, but I remember, I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 through 28 in the Message Bible. It says, uh, take a good look at friends, friends, who you were when you got called in this life. God doesn't choose the brightest and the best. He doesn't choose the most influential, not many from high society families. But God chooses the nobodies. And what you have to understand is so that he gets the glory, it goes on to say. And there's a moment where you begin to shift. But I wrote a chapter in there about how I dealt with depression for years. I could preach to thousands and go to bed and lay in the pillow and scream, God, why am I such a failure? It was a demonic lying spirit. Until one day God made me. I was preaching in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, 150th anniversary of a battle to prove that all men are created equal. The only color that matters is the color red, the blood of Jesus. Anybody with me so far? And God woke me up one morning, and I, was, I felt the cloud coming, and, and my wife understood that term when I would tell her. And all of a sudden, he said, now go dance before me in Gettysburg. I said, Lord, I will get arrested. I'm so white. I can't dance. He said, if you'll go praise me, I'll turn your morning into dancing. And he broke that thing off me. And I wrote about that. But then, we, but then, we, then Karen wrote the book, Dehydrated, about how to have well encounters. And then we wrote a book called Rebuilding the Altar Together. And by the way, if you decide you want to grab one of those, every single penny goes to Abby's house, our orphanage we're building in Moldova that rescues girls. And, but everything. But I'm, I'm saying that for a reason, and, and you don't have to. But I'm saying that for a reason, but because I do want to encourage you, because I've got to share for just a few moments the book we wrote called Rebuilding the Altar. In fact, this last week, my son and I, Nate, and I went and climbed a 14er in Colorado. So we climbed 22,229 feet. And, and, and after the tree line, which is about 11,200 feet, you, 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 you struggle with breath because trees don't grow anymore. And, and we're climbing this mountain, and we're going up top, and I'm praying in the Spirit. And I'm listening to talking to Jesus by elevation the whole time and just to keep from cussing. Amen. And... There's a few times <laughs> I have Christian cuss words like sanctification. <laughs> you, were, you drive 45 and tell me you won't say that to somebody. <laughs> and I'm up there, and I, while I'm walking up there, I had planned on sharing about our new book called Restore the Roar, How to Defeat Fear Through the Breath and Power of God. We wrote it right before the pandemic, and the Lord said, you're going to talk about the altar because this church gets it. See, you have to understand the altar is not a piece of wood. It's a lifestyle. And I'm reminded, Karen and I, uh, when Karen walked through leukemia and after a year, God radically healed her, literally standing on a stage in Brazil to 25,000 women, Holy Spirit whispers to her and said, I've healed your blood. We flew back home. Uh, she flew back home. I was in Charlotte speaking. He said to me, the storm is over. I flew back home. Uh, both of us met. We went to the oncologist and our, our oncologist who's pre-Christian, You got to speak life over people comes in and he goes i don't know how to tell you this but your dna changed and he's one of the top in america true story true story why are some healed why are others not i don't know but i reminded about every time we would get the report from the doctor we'd walk into the house and we'd lay that on our altar in our bedroom that that blood disorder report and we'd say no we're not dealing with this. See, I've got to talk about the place of the encounter, but there was a scripture that we loved, and it's found in Psalms, and I'm going to take you to Luke chapter 15. I've got, I, I want you to stay with me for just a moment because, see, I've learned you can only preach where you survived. Don't tell me theory, show me scars. Because it's impossible to have compassion without first having pain. And scars on earth are testimonies in heaven. And some of you in this room have been through some things. 
In fact, I don't hang out with people that haven't been through stuff because they're just weird. Put me around somebody that had to, had to fight, had to claw, had to battle, had to war. I love the authenticity of what you said about depression because I know that thing. I grew up in that house. And see what you have to know. I'm sharing a message called the altered. But I love this verse in, in, in Psalm uh, chapter 5, verse 3. And it's in the Message Bible. And if you don't like the Message Bible, write me an email. I have a spot for that one. And so <laughs> it's like immediately it just goes, no. Okay, watch. Every morning, you'll hear me at it again. Every morning, I lay out the pieces of my life on your altar and watch for the fire to descend. And when Karen was going through the darkest season, her body's aching, her body's screaming, it's dying on the inside. She, this was our verse, and we would say, God, put the fire around here, and you can melt all those pieces back together and create the most beautiful mosaic. Can I talk about the altar? And again, it's not a piece of wood, it's a lifestyle. I brought an altar From cover to cover, God's word has one word on it. From Old Testament to New Testament. And that word is redemption. To purchase with blood. It was all God's plan to get us back to a tree. What started at a tree would end up at a tree. But I love the fact that there's my favorite altar call in the Bible. And, and it's found in Luke chapter 15. And the Bible says this. It says this. So he got up and he went to his papa. But when he was a long ways off, his father was filled with compassion. That word compassion is in the Greek is splagchis namoa. And it means to ache from within. I don't know about you, but this week watching the news, I've had a lot of ache from within. In fact, in Jesus' name, we pray for the people of Afghanistan. We pray for our troops. We pray for the Americans that are there. That are there. We pray for those that are, that are trying to get home and those that are trying to get out in Jesus' name. Do a biblical divine miracle. Do something, Lord, it isn't about donkeys or elephants. It's about lambs. And in Jesus' name, we pray that you will reach down and do something big. Be with our troops. In your name we pray. Amen. But it goes on to say, while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. When we wrote the book, Rebuilding the Altar, it wasn't because we were being super religious and trying to say that you have to have a piece of wood. It had nothing to do with any of that. It's about the fact that every single day at different times you can have an encounter with God, whether it's on the Peloton or whether it's ride, riding to work. Let me just speak this to you. This is school started back. Mom and Dad, can I just declare something to you? When you're taking those babies to school, when you're, when you're walking them to the bus stop, whatever it might be, I wanted to encourage you to declare who they are before the world tells them who they aren't. You remind them and you wash them with the word and you prophesy their future and you declare their call to change the world. You tell them how great they are because they're going to go to school and when they get home, rewash them again. And what you have to understand, it's when we can no longer stomach the stench of compromise that we arise and run to the father. I must hurry. And see, what I'm about to share with you, I was told when we wrote this book, Rebuilding the Altar, literally when we wrote this, I was told by people, they said, they said you're going to get attacked. Well-known people, great authors, well-known Christian people. They said, your calendar's going to get canceled. Your finances are going to go down. None of that happened. But what's cool is when I get to heaven, I don't have to look over and say, we do all right. I get to look at him and he's going to say, well done. Well, you got to go through the fire to be well done. Amen. Redneck term. Amen. 
And so what you have to realize is I'm reminded of when we started writing this and I started, I was praying one morning and I said, I mean, we started getting attacked. It's when Karen's body started changing and she was under attack and I didn't understand it. And crazy stuff was happening. Crazy demonic things were taking place, just weird stuff. And, 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 um, and God bless you. Uh, I mean, if you gonna go that loud, we're going to say it. And so, <laughs> My son says that if there's an elephant in the room, you're going to point at it and ride it. (laughs) Roll tide. So watch. But all of a sudden, one morning, I'm on my knees and I'm praying. And I said, God, I can't do this. I'm under attack. I don't want to write this book, this dumb book, this stupid book. And he said, okay, I'll give it to somebody else. And after about 10 minutes, I said, no, we'll do it. Because all he asks you to be is faithful, nothing else. And I was told by people, pat your old cloth. This is out of touch. This is, you, you, you know, uh, this doesn't work in the Hollywood set Christianity of today where there's nothing past the front door. One fellow even said, you're becoming a dinosaur of ministry. And I got offended till I realized that when dinosaurs die, they leave oil for the next generation. But God began to stir this, and I'm reminded my son was in high school, and we get very authentic in the book because I don't care who you are. If, you, if you're not coming up against the devil, it's because you flow with him. And all of a sudden, in fact, the greater the anointing, the greater the isolation, and the greater the attack, and nobody ever prophesies over quiet days. But you go through seasons when it's just you and Jesus, and he's trying to talk to you, and he's trying to take you to the next level. And I'll never forget... Uh, my son was in high school. I'm traveling the world. I'm speaking, and he's a senior. My daughter is in, in second grade, and, and Karen and I are traveling, and we're doing life. And if the devil cannot make you sin, he just makes you busy. We got busy. We got out of whack. And all of a sudden, one morning, we're getting ready for school, and my son has been on recruiting trips for football. He was a solid, really good high school football player. We're being recruited to play high school or college football. And, and all of a sudden, we didn't know some stuff was being introduced to him, but we both had dreams because we have a sleep disorder called Revelation. I mean, we used to spank our kids before they did stuff. Amen. And what'd you dream last night, mom and dad? Come here. You know what you did in the future. And I'll never forget the Lord showed us that he was under attack. He, was in, he would be killed in a car accident, but it was more of a spiritual death. And, and so all of a sudden, one morning, we're getting ready for school. And about that time, all of a sudden, um, Nate goes, Dad, somebody's on the back porch. Abby goes, Daddy, somebody's on the back porch. Karen goes, Pat, somebody's on the back porch. We were living in Birmingham, Alabama at the time. And I turned around, and we have a privacy fence and a little wooden porch. And I turn around, and I see this hooded man. What do you think of the grim reaper, reaper or the death angel? And, and being that, that, that I'm a redneck, I'm just ready to fight. I mean, I don't even know. I mean, no reason. Let's just go. We even take off our shirt for no reason. But I think it's because mama said, don't tear your shirt. And so all of a sudden I go running out there and nothing was out there. And I said, God, what was that? He said, your house is under attack. The enemy has come for your house. Restore my altar. And we did warfare. And we fought for our family. We reclaimed our son. And he had his heart restored in some areas. I'm not going to go into that, but I'm telling you this. I'm preaching about the altered for a reason because I brought this with me. And I just want to tell you that there's going to be a moment at the end of this service where you get to have an encounter with God, but you can also have it tonight at your house. You can also have it tomorrow in the car. You can have it on uh, wherever you're at. But see, I brought this with me, and you have to understand, I'll never forget how this was birthed when all of a sudden a friend of mine, and I'll come back to the prodigal son at the end of this, but a friend of mine who's a brilliant scientist, doctor, uh, CEO, and prophet. It's a combination of cool. And came up to me at my board of directors meeting several years ago, and he said, we're getting ready to leave, and it's for our ministry. And all of a sudden he said, hey, Pat, I need to tell you something. I go, yes, sir. What is it, Dr. Mark? He goes, the Lord told me to tell you this. And I said, okay, what is it? He wants to tie you to the altar. I went, okay. Gotcha. No idea what he was talking about. But I couldn't shake it. I showed up at a church and somebody brought me an altar. Couldn't shake it. 
So, so write this down. Tie me to the altar. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that, that, that we're called to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to him. So I began to study this thing, and I just couldn't get it. I did, I'm like, what does it mean, tie me to the altar? What does that even mean? So I went to Psalms chapter 118, verse 26, and it says this, the scripture of verse 27, God is the Lord. He's given us the light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, the horns of the altar. I still couldn't shake it. What are you trying to say to me, God? went on for months. It wasn't a two-day journey. It was a two-month journey. Then I went to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where it says, For the love of God constrains me. It means uh, it, it, it overwhelms me. It's so powerful. It compels. In other words, the word constrain is like taking an oversized pillow and, and putting it in a smaller box. You take the boundaries of God. And so because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and I, I, I started going deeper. I started studying, and I said, What does it mean to be tied to the altar? What does that even mean, Lord? What do you mean? The New Testament is you constrain me. Okay, I get it, God. What does that mean? John chapter 15, I'm the vine, you're the branch. If you abide in me, you'll do great things. Apart from me, you're thrown out. Tie me back to him. Tie me back to that eight-year-old kid who is at a youth camp with my father laying in his lap at one in the morning and saying, Dad, I don't want to go to bed till I get filled with the Spirit. Take me back to the 16-year-old kid that literally hated the church because I had tied Jesus to the church when he died for the church. And he came walking into my bedroom at 3 o'clock in the morning. I write about it when we build the altar, and he said, Pat, I'm real. And I said, that why did this, 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 why did my mom have a breakdown? Why did she try to kill herself? Why? I went through the whole thing. Tie me back to those moments that shifted me. Tie me back. You know, we, when we're born, they dedicate us at the altar. Um, when we're uh, married, we meet at the altar. Some of y'all went to the courthouse. I mean, but you do what you do. When they die, they put us at the altar with a casket. Why don't we visit every now and then? pastor comes up and says, hey, would you come down to the altar for a few minutes? And you're like, I don't have time. We're hungry. We want to get to the restaurant. And the whole time our family's spiritually starving. Could you not tarry with me for a moment is what he said to the disciples. I mean, they fell asleep with him down a few feet. And this isn't a condemnation message. I mean, I get it. Schedule's crazy at times. I've had to shoot outdoors, get on planes. I get all that. So you have to know my heart on this. Do you understand we're the remnant? We are those that will no longer squander the daylight with things that do not matter, but live waiting for night to fall. When men have fear in their hearts, that is when their light from God shines ever so bright as they climb upon the altar. But see, you're never going to understand this until you do this, right? Until you do this second part. And this is where I had to come. We must become frustrated. Frustration. What do you mean? I'm frustrated at secular Christianity. I'm, I'm frustrated that you can do church without Jesus. That's why I love this house. This is the real deal. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated that people want Father, Son, and Holy Scriptures, but they'll kick out the Holy Spirit as a beggar in the street for a once-a-year encounter at some retreat center. And I get it. I want him every day. I want the fullness of God. But when you remove one-third of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three and one, when you remove one-third, one-third from 100 is 33.3, leaves the number 66.6, .6, the spirit of the anti-anointed. See, I've, walked, I've been in too many services. You've you got to understand, I'm a drug dealer's kid. My dad got saved when I was five, worked for the mafia in Detroit. You have to know, I, our family altar was a, was a toilet. It set our family free. No one had ever been saved in our family. But you have to get my heart, what I'm talking about. I'm not, this isn't a condemning word. This is one of those words that says, he, he's calling. He's saying, do you want more? It's that place where you, I, I'm frustrated that grace is preached wrong. Grace is the most beautiful word in Christianity besides Jesus. It's the nine definitions that are the throne of God. 
When you study the grace and what it really means, it'll change your life. But you know what grace is? Titus 2, it's an empowerment to live a godly life, not to do whatever I want. It's the boundaries that God put, puts on me. It's, the, it's the, the gut check where he whispers, don't go in that room, don't go there. I mean, he saved my life so many times. You have to understand what I'm talking about. You know what grace is? The true, the, to me, the true definition of grace is, is God accepts me as I am, but he loves me too much to leave me that way. In a day and age where they want you to preach with a feather and not a sword, can I share something like this with you? Because this house loves God's word. That's why I love this man right here. This house preaches truth and tells you the truth with love. Can I just tell you, no more celebrities. The true newspaper coverage of the called is an obituary of self and the birth announcement of revival. And revival is when God gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented that he shows up. I'm talking about frustration. I've spent my whole ministry frustrated, not knowing why, but frustration and agitation are the mother of intercession. God will frustrate you to get you to another level. It's Ecclesiastes 7 3. Frustration is good for the heart. In other words, God says there's more. I know you're frustrated with your boss. I know you're frustrated with your work because you haven't realized that's your mission field yet. I, I know you're frustrated with all this stuff, but I know you're frustrated because you watch too many newsreels. But I want you to understand something. The real frustration is God saying, Come over here. Come to another level. I'm trying to bring you up. I'm trying to pull your family out of something. I'm trying to break that junk off your house. And God's saying, I got more for you. Somebody give him a real praise offering. And no frustration. Jogging down the streets of Dallas in 2011, I was out jogging, getting ready to speak at a big graduation. And well, I wasn't jogging. I was fat then, so I was loitering. And, uh, and God said, I'm going to raise up a remnant. I said, Lord, I don't know what that means. He began to explain it to me, a voice of one crying in the wilderness. I said, God, I don't want to do that. And he said, you don't understand. We're one generation away from the extinction of the move of the Holy Spirit. Remember Joshua 24, he said, as for me and my house, will serve the Lord. But if you go down three generations to Judges 2.10, his grandchildren, it says they grew up and knew neither God nor what he had done for Israel. It got lost. Because you have the first generation has relationship. The second generation has religion. I grew up like that. Church was our social club. Then the third generation has rebellion. They're like, I don't want that. But Jesus came to destroy rebellion, break down religion, and restore relationship. But see, you have to understand what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's when God begins to stir you and begins to say, there's more for you. I've got more. I've got more for you. Because the remnant movement is not for the faint at heart. It's for those that will stand for truth. It's for those that will walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's for those that understand culture will try to cancel you. I told my wife the other day, I said, if culture is going to cancel us, I'm breaking up with them first. It's, it's not you. It's me. I'm going to hurry and close in just a moment. We must restore the place of the encounter. You know what the altar is? The altar is a, pl is a, is a place where what you've been gets interrupted by what you can become. It's the place of encounter. It's the place where God calls you more. It's, it's the place where God says, I have more for you. It's, it's the Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. I love it in the Message Bible. It says, come behind the door, sit down with God, shut everybody else out, and don't try to role play. God doesn't need your resume. It's James 4, 8, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. I'm talking about when you get home today, walk into your house and say, we're going to make this place different. We've been, been watching so much stuff from Hulu to Netflix, stuff we would have never let in before the pandemic, but now over time, it's okay. The compass got moved. We're going to restore that place where we say, okay, God, I'll never forget when I was writing this. I said, God, I'm going to be a man without a church. And he said, so, he spoke this to my spirit when I was praying one morning. He said, that's okay, son. I'd rather be a man without a church than a bridegroom without a bride. And it's that place where God begins to shift you. It's what Leonard Raven, he wondered, he's an, uh, a preacher from many years ago. He said this. He's one of my favorite. He said, the greatest miracle that God can do today is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world and make him holy, then put him back into that world and keep him holy in it. It's the place of encounter. It's not a piece of wood. It's about living a life of saying, we're going to touch heaven today.
And even when the heavens are closed, I'm still going to keep doing what he told me to do because faith, faith is, is trusting in him. It's Psalms 84 verse 3. Even a sparrow has a place near your nest, O God. And what you have to understand is what I love about this house. You see healings here. You see miracles here. This is a place that God trusts with his presence. He told me that when I was climbing that mountain. He said, I want you to prepare yourself because you have to understand we must restore the altar. It's what happened with Elijah when God walked up to him. And, and, and he thought he was the only one left. He rebuilds the altar. The fire God comes. First Kings 18. He's fighting against Ahab and Jezebel. I don't have time to go into all that. He's running for his life after his greatest day of ministry because your best Sunday is your pastor's worst Monday. Then he goes and finds Elisha, lays his mantle on him because after you rebuild the altar, then comes the fire. But at one point, Paul quoted him. The apostle Paul quoted him in Romans 11, verse 5. And he said, I'm the only one left, God. And God says, there's 7,000 that haven't bowed. You narcissist preacher. That's what he was saying to him. God said it nicer. So too at the present time there's a remnant chosen by grace. And what you have to realize is there's a moment where you must restore him. He's God saying, I want to move in this nation. I love what William Booth, one of my favorite Salvation Army founders, he's one of my heroes. He said, he said, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, heaven without hell. So let me get ready to close. Why would I preach this here? Because God wants to, he just wants to hang out. To remove the altar is to banish Jesus. And I'm not talking about a piece of wood. I'm talking about to have, not have an encounter with him. You understand from cover to cover, it was all about getting back to the tree. And then you do something with it. Romans 8 says he became me on the cross so I could become him to the world. That's why his father walked away from him on the cross. That's why he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because when God looked at him, he no longer saw his son, he saw Pat. And he's like, well, I, you're not my kid. And Jesus goes, but I am. I just don't look like him because I look like Pat. But when you begin to study God's word, it's all about the encounter. It's all about the altar. You remember the first altar, right? It wasn't when Cain killed a, a Cain and Abel or the, the, the sacrifice of, of Abel, and that was the first tithe. But the first altar is, remember Noah? He's been floating in death for 360 days. He lands at Mount Ararat. It's so high up, it's above the tree line, which is 11,000 feet, 200. And suddenly he gets in his mind, you know what? I want to bless God for saving me and my family. I want to build him an altar. I want to, I want to make a sacrifice. Has no wood, so he takes the doors off the altar. Starts cooking animals. God comes near, and he says, you know what? Because of this, I'm never going to destroy the earth like this again. One man. His family's saved. The door. Let's cross-reference that with one man. Out of his belly shall flow rivers. Who became the door, Luke chapter 10. Who gave his life for all humanity. On a cross, he became the altar. But when you begin to look at God's word, Leviticus chapter 6, keep the fire burning on the altar. Leviticus chapter 9, make sacrifice at the altar. The whole Bible is about the altar encounter. It's a nasty place. You know, Revelation 6 says the martyrs are under the altar. I asked God one day when I was praying, I said, God, why are the martyrs under the altar? Because there's a special place in heaven where the martyrs are under the altar. They live under the altar. I said, God, why do they live under the altar? They said, and the Lord spoke to my heart, well, son, so they can hear the prayers of the saints to know their sacrifice wasn't in vain. But see, the problem was, in the Old Testament, I couldn't get to the altar. There was a gap. I looked for a man to stand in a gap, and I could find none. Ezekiel 22. If there's a gap. I wanted to get to the altar, but I couldn't get to the altar. You have to understand, I needed a lamb to get me to the altar. I needed a perfect lamb because they had feasts. They had harps. They had bowls, but we needed a lamb. And if I would have gone near the altar, the high priest would have said, Sorry, you don't belong there. I'll take your sacrifice laid on the altar. God will accept the sacrifice, and I'll bless you. But I didn't want somebody in the middle. I wanted to get to him. I needed a personal God. And so you have to understand, I needed a perfect 
perfect lamb, a lamb skin that would cover the man's nakedness in the garden. I needed a lamb whose blood could sprinkle on the altar. I needed a lamb, a lamb like Isaiah said, one who comes and openeth not his mouth. I needed a perfect lamb till suddenly after hundreds and actually after thousands of years, all of a sudden John the Baptist would suddenly step up in a river one day and say, whoa, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the earth. And Jesus would begin to do miracle after miracle after miracle, casting out demons, healing the sick, calming the storm, feeding the thousands. But that's not why Jesus came. That's called chilling when you're God. He came because I needed a lamb on the altar. And when he got ready to go to the cross, they would try to stop him because they want to crown him, but he wanted to be glorified. Big difference. I needed someone that was moved. I needed a Hebrews 4. I needed a 2 Timothy mediator between God and man. Someone to stand in the middle. And so when he got ready to go to the cross, he would go to eight different stations for me. You're not getting this yet as I wrap this up. I wanted to get to the altar. I couldn't get to the altar. The altar is the most valuable thing we have. The lifestyle of relationship. But I couldn't go there. He would be condemned for me. He would accept his cross for me. Another man from another nation of another color would carry his cross for him. He would speak to the women of Israel and say, don't weep for me, weep for your children. See, you have to understand he would stop at these places because he was getting ready to do something big in the world. They would tear his garments off of him so I could put on a garment of praise once again. They would take him and they would put him on that cross and they would nail him between two thieves yesterday and tomorrow. He would speak to his mother and say, thank you for carrying me. Someday they'll all carry me. And then, and then he would die. He would give up his breath. He would declare it as finished. And it was such a powerful roar from the cross. We write about that in, in Restore the Roar. It would go from a lamb to a lion. And he would roar. But you're not getting this just yet, friends. Because you don't understand. When he died, he didn't stay there. Somebody help me for a second. When he died, he got up off the altar. The altar was no longer such a place of death. It was a place of resurrection. And that's why the Bible says in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, I could not get to the altar, but his body became a curtain it was ripped open for me and I now had access all of a sudden a bridge to run across a great divide called sin and I had the power to run up to him who became the altar and wrap myself around him and all of us oh you're not getting this yet why should you have an encounter on the way to school why should you have an encounter on the way to work because he opened the door why wouldn't you? He said, if you abide in me. And this is it. Worship uh, leaders, would you join me? I read that story. Remember that story in the opening? It's my favorite. See, he outran the village for me. The story of the prodigal is my favorite. It actually is a great description of the Christian nation, the prodigal, the Jewish nation, the older brother. Neither one know how to accept his love. But see, the Jewish boy runs off. He ends up in pigs, slop. I got some wild hogs behind my farm. I wish I could. Anyway, if a legion cast him in anyway. But he wakes up one day. He just didn't use wisdom. He had wasted his inheritance. He could not go home without being a slave. Because if he'd have went home, the whole city would have run out to meet him. It's called Kazaza. They would have bre- broken a pot of burnt beans and corn at his feet. And they would have made him a slave. And they would have ran to him and marked him. See, people don't know that. So the Bible says, all of a sudden, he gets up and he's walking home and he's coming up with every excuse. But he doesn't know that his dad's been doing this. Where are you at, baby? Where are you at, champ? Where are you at? That's what I did for my son. I flew home from Kerrville, Texas, well, San Antonio one day to get to my son. 
He said, Dad, I need you. I got to change. I've been up all night. Raced to him and tackled him. He's walking home, and all of a sudden, the Bible says when he was a long ways off, his dad saw him. He takes off running. Can you imagine, like, what's dad doing? This is against the law. Dads don't run. His dad probably looked ticked, not because he was mad at his son, but he saw the devil behind his son. So if you ever think God's mad at you, it's because he's looking at the enemy behind you and he's saying, get away from my baby. The Bible says he falls on him. Do you know why he ran? He was out running the village that was going to accuse his own son. They all love to accuse. And he said, hey, 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 put my ring on. Put my coat on. Put my shoes on. I don't want them to see me. I want them to see you when they get here. We're going to have a party. But why are you doing this, Dad? Because the son of mine was lost, but now found. I'm done. Stand with me. No, I feel your presence, Lord. Oh, I feel it all over me. Man, God's here. Hang with us for 30 seconds. You've got to do something. See, in the Bible, whenever you plant an altar, <clears throat> study his word, Amos, 1 Kings, stand at the altar, make a judgment, reaper overtakes the plowman. Anytime you plant an altar, it rains. Harvest comes. So you've got to anoint the next generation. That's what we're doing after this service. The minute I dropped this altar, and I've already put one in pastor's house a long time ago. I had it delivered to his house. The Lord told me to. He said he knows how to use it. But the minute, he really did, didn't I? The minute I dropped this altar, it's going to rain. It's a rule. It means God owns the land. You might feel him running towards you, man. Because he outruns the accuser. Man, I feel it. I feel his presence. I've been through some seasons lately where I hadn't felt him real strong, but I, oh, I feel him now. I'm sorry. If I'm a little emotional, I can't help it. Dad's home. Won't you tie me to you, Lord? Need your presence once again, oh God. I'm at the end of where I've been. Won't you take me back again, oh Lord? It's just me and you right here. So tie me to the altar. The place where I am safe. place of no excuses, a place where I am free. I'm sorry, I'm caught up. So tie me to the altar. I want to see your face. can get out of the mirror just to see your smile again.
Say that part with me. Just tie me to the altar. You don't even know what you're saying. It may be. So tie me to the altar. The place where I am free. Oh, the place where I am free. The place where I find freedom. The place where I find freedom. The place I can be me. The place where I can be me. So tie me to the altar. Just kind of making this up. So tie me to the altar. The place where I am free. The place where I can see you. I'm so sorry, I cannot stop. The place where I am free. Just one more time, tie me to the altar. Lift your hands, if you will, if you feel good about that. So tie me to the altar. The place where I am free. Say it, would you help me? Help me. Oh, so tie me to the altar. Please, where I am free. Please, where I am free. Please, where I can be me. Please, where I can be me. Oh, it's the place I want to see. Once more, we see. this place. There are people in this room, I've literally just preached, I've literally just preached an altar call this entire time. If you say, Pat, I need Jesus Christ to save me and change me, and I don't care what nobody thinks. None of that matters to me, no. I just want God. I just want God. I just want God. I'm a long ways off, and he's running towards me, and I feel him coming towards me. And if you say, I need to restore my life and restore my soul with God right now. Maybe you've wandered off. Maybe you've never accepted him. Jesus is the Christ. He's the one true God. And right now, across this room, from corner to corner, with, with no one looking, if you say, Pat, I need him. I just need him. If that's you, I've been there a few thousand times. You say, I want God to be my Lord and Savior complete. Raise your hand now. Man, there's hands going up all over here. I'm so stinking proud of you. Look, raise it higher. Who gives a rip who sees you? I could care less what anybody thinks. I just got a little too much Texas in me now. I don't care. I just don't care. Come on, raise it up higher. If you say... I've been wandering lately and I've just been through some stuff. I'm tired and I'm weary. Raise your hand too. And I need God. Say, I need God to meet me right now. If you say, and lastly, if you say, Pat, I've got to have, I've got to have an encounter. I got to have God fix some things. And I mean, I'm just there right now. Raise your hand too. Would you do something? If you need to slip out, we want you to go. Please just, if you need to go, there's no like, oh, how do you do that? I want you to know you can go. But before you go, we're going to pray this first. If you just raise your hand, raise it up again one more time if you don't mind. You know what you're doing there. You're just saying, hey, pick me. Put me on the team. You're not bench warmers anymore. God's saying, I want you in my family. And you know what it also means? He's about to pull you up. I just climbed with my son up 14,000 feet. And there was a few times where I said, son, I can't do it. And he goes, dad. True story. Dad, I got you. Come on. I got you, Dad. That was the day the 
son became the father. That really just happened three days ago. So raise your hand up again one more time, if you would. If you just raise it for any of those reasons, now raise the other hand. Now with all everyone, and there's hands all over this house raised, I want everybody to pray this. So, so say, Jesus, hold on, real, real soft if you don't mind. Say, Jesus. Now look, hold on. Do you know that when you say that name, hell trembles? Do you know that when you say that name, heaven leans over? Do you know that when you say that name, Jesus goes, yes? So you need to say it with boldness. Say it if you're, as if your kid's about to walk out in front of a car. It's the name that, call, that if you call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. If I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ. So say, Jesus. Yeah. There we go. Hands raised. Say, Jesus. Jesus. You're the real deal. You're the Christ. Change me. Forgive me. I need you. You don't even realize he's right in front of you. Say, Jesus, restore my soul. Heal my heart, mind, and body. Your cross had healing power for the soul and the body. So in Jesus' name, Fill me with your spirit. Start me over. Jesus, I need a friend. This takes closer than a brother. So get ready. It's going to get strong. Come on, dads. Come on, moms. Come on, grandparents. I'm a grandfather. So say this strongly. So Jesus, tie me to you. 